Hi, Matthias from 10 Minute Physics here. Welcome to tutorial number five. Today I'm going to show you how to simulate constraint dynamics in the simplest possible way. This is an important tutorial because many ideas that follow will be based on it. Let's start. Okay, so let's have a look at constraint dynamics. Our balls could so far move freely except in the case of collisions. In the real world, however, motions of objects or parts of them are typically restricted. One of the simplest examples, which is often used as the first example in textbooks, is the beat on a circular wire. Here, the beat only has one degree of freedom instead of two. A more practical example is a robot arm. There are six rigid parts, each of which has multiple degrees of freedom. However, with the joint constraints, only four are left. There are three main methods to handle constraints in physical simulations. I will take the beat on wire example to explain them. The simplest approach is to have a spring that pulls the bead back on the wire. The problem with this approach is that we have to tune the stiffness of the spring. We want it to be as big as possible, however, big stiffnesses cause problems in numerical simulators. A popular approach is to use generalized coordinates. Instead of describing the location of a bead with x and y coordinates, we describe it with a single angle alpha. Now the bead stays on the wire by construction. However, this approach gets involved very quickly, even for this simple example. Here are screenshots of the derivation taken from the great page myphysicslab.com. As you can see, you need to be good at both calculus and trigonometry to understand it. A third and popular approach is to solve for constraint forces. These forces make the velocity tangential to the constraint manifold, in this case the circle. However, with this approach, the constraints remain satisfied only if they are satisfied to begin with. Therefore, an additional feedback mechanism is necessary to counteract drift. Here are screenshots of SIGGRAPH course notes by Andrew Witkin, which explain the approach. The derivation is a bit simpler for the beat on circle example, but still non-trivial. So how can we make this simpler? Here's our bead. Unfortunately, it is not on the wire. What is the simplest way to fix this problem? Right, simply put it on the wire. In order to get the physics right, we need to move it to the closest point on the wire. However, we cannot just change the position, we have to modify the velocity as well. In this example, the bead is in the equilibrium position. Gravity pulls on it constantly. We put the bead back to the circle every time step. However, because we don't modify the velocity, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. This has the effect that we will have to apply a bigger and bigger force to be able to move the bead. Here is the simplest way to fix the velocity. In the time step, we add the velocity times dt to the position as in previous examples. What is new is that we move the position to satisfy the constraint. At the end of the time step, we simply set the velocity to the current position minus the position at the beginning of the time step divided by dt. So here's our final algorithm. First, we add gravity times dt to the velocity. Then we store the current position in the variable p. Next, we add the velocity times dt to the position. Now, we move x to satisfy the constraint. Then we compute the new velocity as x minus p divided by dt. So let's code this and try. We start with the HTML document that we used in the previous tutorials. We have a head section with a title that appears in the tab of the browser and some style information. The body of the page only contains one element, which is the canvas that we use to draw our scene. The script section contains all JavaScript code. First, we set up drawing as we did in previous examples. We define the canvas width and height we also define functions to map physical coordinates to screen coordinates. We use the Vector2 class that we wrote in the third tutorial. Here's the physics scene. It contains gravity, dt, and then the center on the radius of the wire and the bead. The bead class looks very much like the ball class we used in previous examples. In the constructor, we define a set of member variables. The radius, the mass, the position. This time we also have a member variable previous position and the velocity. The start step method takes as input dt and gravity. We first add gravity times dt to the velocity. 
This time we store the current position in the variable previous position and then add velocity times dt to the position. The next method keeps the beat on the wire. It takes as input the center and the radius of the wire. First we compute the vector from the center of the wire to the position of the beat. We normalize this vector and compute its length. The constraint error is the radius of the circular wire minus the distance from the center of the wire to the position of the bead. We then add the constraint direction times the constraint error to the position of the bead. At the end of the time step we compute the velocity as the current position minus the previous position divided by dt. In the setup function we set up our physics scene. We first define the center and the radius of the wire. Then we define a position for the bead, create a new bead and store it in the physics scene. For drawing we use the function draw circle that we used in previous tutorials. In the draw function itself we first clear the canvas, then we draw the wire circle and the bead. The simulate function is very simple. In each step we first call start step for the bead, then keep on wire and then end step. The update function looks as usual. We first call simulate, then draw and make sure that the update function is called again and again. Now let's check how this looks in the browser. So here it is, our circular wire with the bead swinging on it. As you can see, it loses energy over time. This is because our method is related to implicit integration. People in the gaming and movie industry mostly use implicit integration and typically do not care too much about this effect because objects in everyday life are highly damped and do not oscillate noticeably. We can reduce this effect quite easily though. In the first tutorial I mentioned substepping as a way to increase fidelity. Let us implement this right now. To do this we add a variable numsteps to the physics scene. And then in the simulation function we have a loop over numsteps. Inside the loop we do exactly as we did before. We call start step, keep on wire, end step. With one important difference, we have first to compute the substep size, which is the time step divided by the number of substeps. Then we use SDT in all function calls here. Now let's see what happens. As you can see, with 10 substeps, energy conservation is significantly improved. Now the question we have to ask is, is this a hack? Is this physical? Let us compare our result to the analytic solution. We have the following equation of motion when the position of the ball is defined by the angle alpha alone. Given the radius r of the circle, the magnitude g of gravity and the current angle alpha, we can compute the change of the angle of velocity omega. Omega then tells us how fast the angle changes. We will use symplectic Euler integration with very small time steps to solve these two equations. Let us implement this. In addition to the regular bead, we now define a class analytic bead. It stores the radius of the wire, its own radius and the position as an angle. In the simulate function we first compute the angular acceleration, as on the slide, by minus gravity divided by the radius of the wire times the sinus of the angle. With the angular acceleration, we update the angular velocity by adding the angular acceleration times dt and the angle by adding the angular velocity times dt. This is a simulation with 10 substeps. In the beginning, the two beads match quite well, but over time, the red bead loses energy. This is the same simulation with 100 substeps and with 1000 substeps. The cool thing is that this simple method converges to the analytic solution with decreasing time step size. We don't need calculus, trigonometry, linearizations, accelerations, forces, tuning, drift fixing and it works for general constraints too. However, what if we need the constraint force for other purposes? The nice thing is that we can actually recover the constraint force. For the beat on circle example we can compute the constraint force analytically. It is the sum of the centrifugal force plus the gravitational force. In PBD we get the constraint force by simply dividing the correction distance by dt squared. Let's check this. 
For this test, I added a step button so we can single step through the simulation. Here you can see the constraint force computed via PBD and here computed analytically. Here we use a thousand substeps. As you can see, the two forces match perfectly. To show you that our method also works in more general setups, I added multiple beads. For this, I copied the function handle ball ball collisions from tutorial number three. Then in the simulation procedure, I call start step for all the beads, keep on wire for all the beads and end step for all the beads. Then I have a nested loop to check all beat beat collisions. Here you see the result. As usual in the description, I provide a link to a page that contains all the HTML documents of all the tutorials. In the next tutorial, I will show you how to extend our approach to handle more general and soft constraints. I hope you had fun and I'll see you in the next tutorial.